Hey, it's 4 o'clock on whatever it is, Thursday, and it's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! <laughs> Boy, am I having video problems today. Like crazy. <laughs> oh, man, what a, a last hour this has been. Uh, you guys may have to just see me uh, looking like I look for the rest of the show today. <laughs> Oh, man, what a mess this is. <laughs> I am having such problems. Um, whoa, that's not good. There we go. Uh, it's a little better. Kind of okay. All right. Whoa. <laughs> Okay, one more adjustment. I'll be right with you. <laughs> it's not easy being blue or green or any of these colors. All right, let me get up here and change this. I will be right with you. It's a good thing it's just you guys, right? <laughs> let's see. One more adjustment here. Hue. Let's go to hue. Oh. All right, well, that's going to have to be good enough for now. Anyway, how are you guys? Good to see you. Uh, let's see who we've got in the room. Actually, no, what we're going to talk about today is how do you decide which listings you're going to pitch to, pitch your music to. So uh, we will talk about that in a second. First, let me say hello to Peter Rahill, Ewart Williams, Martin Gravel, Pat Wara, Andre Stepanian, uh, Super Blonde, Nancy Kalel, Carrie Harchin, Heidi Owen, who haven't I seen yet? Uh, Robbie Hancock. Uh, <laughs> I know, but uh, I've been playing with all kinds of stuff since yesterday, Robbie. I've got all these different adjustments for Logitech cameras. Uh, let's see, I think I've said hello to everybody. Okay. Uh, and Karen Brasher. Hello, Karen. How are you? So yeah, it's uh, I've now downloaded like three different kinds of software that Logitech makes that are all supposed to adjust things like white balance, etc. And apparently they are all uh, fighting each other. So I'm going to have to get rid of one or two of them. Oops, and I'm going to have to turn off my email alerts right now. Watch this. <laughs> it's just going to have to be like this today. What can I say? Um, very frustrating to say the least. Look at those hands. Before, if I turned my head, I would turn orange. If I put my head in the middle, I was fine. Uh, just so frustrating. Let me try one other thing. Let me, there's the green screen. Nope. What the hell? Okay, anyway, uh, so yeah, I want to talk about uh, jazz hands, green jazz. Those are like Kermit jazz hands. Um, how do you decide what you're going to pitch to? Uh, I was working on a taxi project about two hours ago, and I realized, I don't think I've ever asked you guys that. So things that I would put on the list of possible considerations would be is there a, a sync fee, a cash payout up front? Uh, and if so, does that influence? And we can answer all these in a second. We'll go back uh, to you know address each one of these. But does a dollar amount in the listing make you pick one listing to pitch to over another? Could it be that the listing is in your sweet spot, that you write um, singer-songwriter stuff, so every time you see a singer-songwriter listing, that lights you up? Is it something that looks like it's going to be pretty easy to create? For instance, um, you know, like an acoustic guitar dobro cue, you know, that might have a guitar or two and a slide dobro thing overdubbed on it and bam, you're done. Um, is it a listing that goes direct to supervisors? So you're interested in that, so you don't have to split any income with publishers or you feel that you have a more direct in if you get heard by the supervisor. Um, 
Are you hoping for a cut with a major label artist? Wow, all of a sudden my color looks really good. All right, nobody move. Stay right there. <laughs> Um, oh man, it's been just like god awful for the, let's see if the green hand, yeah, green hands are still there. Okay. Um, hoping for a cut with a major label artist, uh, or do you do what I would call strategic pitching, which is, for instance, we've been running listings. I just edited a listing that came in, uh, a company looking for very simple, very sparse, but traditional Greek instrumentals. And it's one of those listings where we add that, you know, if you submit to this and get forwarded, you're going to be probably one of the few things in that library's catalog under Greek music. It's not like pop or country or dramedy or something that they might have dozens of. They might only have like six Greek instrumentals or three or ten. I mean, comparatively few um, compared to other more popular genres. So... Uh, do you think about that stuff? Do you think strategically and think, well, you know, I don't really do Greek music typically, but I'm going to research and see what instrumentation and see if I can find myself a, I don't even know what the little, is it a mandolin, a Greek, Greek stringed instrument? Let's call it a euro. That's it. We'll just call it a euro, whether it's called that or not. Um, hey, Akira. Uh, so, and Marion, hello, if I haven't said hello to you today. If only I had a bazooki. I know, I love bazooki, Joe. That pink gum is the best. Anyway, um, so I'm curious. So let's go back to the top of that list and give me plus ones. Uh, I thought a bazooki was also, was it not a Russian thing as well? Oh, well, I mean, you know, uh, hello, Pierre Venio. Um Greek instrument, hummus. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's go back to the top. Again, we're talking about how do you decide what you're going to pitch your music to. Oh, and I want to mention at the beginning of the show, in case anybody leaves early, and how dare you if you do that, um, I'm going to be out of the office next week, so there won't be any taxi TVs or any quarantinis for a whole week. Uh, there is some possibility, some possibility that I may get my act together and do like a quarantini on Thursday. I don't know. I wouldn't place any bets on that, but uh, we'll see. Um, so I will remind you again at the end of the show. But yes, uh, Taxi TV will be on summer hiatus next week. Anyway, how do you decide what you're going to pitch to? Let's talk first about... Um, uh, whether or not if there's a sync fee involved. Um, so give me a plus one if <laughs> therapy is next. Um, give me a plus one if seeing a dollar amount in the listing influences you to want to pitch to that. You guys are like my uh, human lab rats. <laughs> So Bonzo, I don't know what that means. Minus one, 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 one. So is that a no? <laughs> is that a trick question? No, it's not a trick question, Marion. Uh, repeating for Andre and anybody else who wasn't paying attention in class today. Andre, you get two demerits. Um, the question is, if you see a listing that says like a $3,500 sync fee, or it's for a $20,000 commercial, or it's a $250 sync fee for an indie film, does any sort of dollar amount kind of trigger a response in you and make you want to pitch to that listing? The Taxi Guinea Pig Guild. 
Um, or if the artist is Taylor Swift. All right, so, you know, if I had to rough it out, I'd say like 70% of you answer the plus one. I got some, <laughs> some other answers I don't really understand. Uh, okay, so that's interesting. All right, let's uh, look at the dollar thing a different way. What if it's a $25,000 TV commercial? Um, would that influence you to pitch? Plus one if the answer is yes on that. So I'm interested that um, some of you are saying if it's a really high dollar thing, then it's going to be super competitive. So does that mean that you're not going to take a chance? That Okay, let's do another question. Um, if you perceive that there's going to be, uh, you know, competitive is the wrong word, though. Now that I'm thinking about it, competitive is actually the wrong word um, because Competitive, you know, means that there's competition. There's really not a competition, not amongst you guys. You're only competing with the bar, the quality bar. So is a more correct way to say it that the bigger the dollar amount um, or the high, the high, the stuff with a high dollar amount is going to be hard to be forwarded to? Give me a plus one if you agree with that, that I shy away from listings with a high dollar amount because I believe the screeners will have a really super high bar. Interesting. There was a time when any time there was a, a listing that had money attached to it, we'd get a, a lot of submissions. Okay. So... Now let's go on to the next one. Um, are you prone to submit your music when the request is in your sweet spot? In other words, a type of music, a genre, a style, a type that you routinely do and you're comfortable with it, um, are you, does that influence you to make a submission? So. Plus one, if you make submissions when the request is in your sweet spot and that influences you. Okay, good to know. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this next one. Give me a plus one if you see a listing and say to yourself, oh, that's easy, I could bang that out quickly because it's not a lot of instruments. For instance, the uh, acoustic guitar dobro thing or maybe a solo piano thing or maybe a little romantic French music while you're standing on a bridge overlooking the Seine at you know, sunset. Um, 
and, and it's just like a, a piano and a concertina or whatever they call those little uh, accordions. Why don't they just call it a, a demi accordion or a petite accordion? Why do they call it a concertina? <laughs> I know Andre will know the answer to this. He's that kind of guy. He knows the answer to strange things. Um, okay, so uh, plus one, if you would make a submission or be encouraged, influenced, want to make a submission to something because you go, oh, that's not that hard to do, not that much work. Maybe we should do a course at the Road Rally called, uh, or did I do that already? Procrastination Nation? I should bring in experts, like a heavy duty shrink that can teach you guys how to not procrastinate. I might attend that class as well. Ah, the small French accordions are called musettes. Good to know. I would have thought that would be an adorable little female fairy that would sit on my shoulder while I write poetry. That's my musette. <laughs> oh, I can't even say female anymore. I think I just did something politically incorrect, didn't I? <laughs> um, question, should we submit more than one to those easy listings? I would. It's five bucks. And if you feel like you're good at that genre and it's easy, hell yeah. Um, triggered oh no Dan Ash has been triggered by my musette comment please whoops what the hell is that stop 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 um Musette is a special accordion tuning with three reeds detuned to make a chorus effect. Cool. Kind of like um, when you tune a piano and you slightly detune it by like one cent to, with every octave or something to give it more. Uh, I once had a piano tuner tell me that's called the spread. Okay. I thought spread was Nutella or peanut butter personally, but if you want to get technical, Mr. Piano Tuner. Um, how many submissions is too many? That's an unanswerable question, Dan. I, I don't know. I I would say that back in the day, which was a very long time ago, like 20, you know, some years ago when I was still screening, if I saw somebody um, send in like more than three or four things for a particular listing uh, and do that on a regular basis, there are some people that will just submit a lot of stuff for every listing. I think, okay, they're super wealthy, uh, or they're just playing crazy. <laughs> one or the other. But if you know, if one time, like let's say you're really good at doing dramedy cues, and we had a really great listing with a great library, looking for dramedy cues, and you sent in three, four, five things, I, I wouldn't think you were nuts unless I saw you personally. And the screeners do. Oh, there's that person again. You know. So that probably does happen. Um, I don't know that it influences them. I wouldn't think it influences them as to what they can forward or not. But I will tell you something that I can't say every screener has ever told me. This is just something I personally experienced is if I had three or more pieces of music from one member and uh, you know what? Back in the day, everything came on CD or cassette. This doesn't happen now because they're fed randomly to the screeners. Look at that. How cool is that? Wow, mind-blowing. <laughs> anyway, because things are fed randomly to the screeners, um, they probably wouldn't get three in a row or four in a row or five in a row from the same person. But back in the day when I got a cassette that had two, three, four, or five on there, I personally tended to forward the couple of best ones. Um, if two were really good and a third one was also good, but not as good as the other two, 
I wouldn't forward the one that wasn't as good. And my thinking for that was, well, first of all, it's just not as good. And second of all, if the receiving party, the end user, library, supervisor, whatever, um, gets this and they hear two really good ones and one that's not as good, it might influence them in a negative way to think, oh, maybe they just got lucky on those guys. Um, so that's just my thinking. Um, and also you don't want to inundate the person on the receiving end. I think sometimes, and I don't know this for a fact, don't quote me on this, I can't say that I absolutely know this, but I think that when screeners do encounter more than one thing from the same person, um, that they tend to look for the shining star because they want to put your best foot forward. But like I said, they're fed the stuff randomly, so the chances of them getting three in a row from you, not that great. All right. Um, now, all right, uh, the next thing I want to ask you about, um, are you influenced and encouraged to submit when you see a listing that says direct to supervisor plus one? If you are encouraged to submit to a listing when it says direct to supervisor, please click plus one now. We already have a taxi museum. I'll have to give you a tour of that sometime. This is really fascinating. Um, I'm learning something about you guys and I guess our members as a whole, because um, you guys are a pretty good cross-section, I would imagine. Um, it's I find it interesting that you are that you perceive it to be harder to get forwarded for a listing that's got a dollar amount attached to it um, but not harder to be forwarded for something that's going direct to the supervisor very interesting Yeah, well, that's why we're talking about doing the taxi garage, because a lot of the supervisors we know, um, they're oftentimes, they can't use taxi because they need stuff in an hour or two or five. Um, and it doesn't give us time to run a listing and then screen your stuff and then get the result over to them. So the garage, it, to be honest, we do some of that behind the scenes um, because we want to make the supervisors happy. So there are, I don't know, maybe once a month or something where the guys in the A&R department, not the screeners, but the, the staff A&R people, will get a request from somebody and, and they need it in an hour. And like I've said before, they'll just go in and look at like the last three or four listings or two or three, whatever the number is, listings for that genre. Look at the stuff that got forwarded. And when they see something, they go, oh yeah, I remember that piece that was really good. Or they might do a little listening to it. Um, they'll go in and hand select a few and then reach out to the members that they've selected. Say, by the way, we've got a little quickie emergency. Can we, uh, is it okay if we send this piece over? And uh, is that piece still available? So there you go. Direct to supervisor is appealing. All right, so what makes direct to supervisor appealing to you? Is it the that you get to keep all the money? Is it that you feel like uh, if the supervisor hears me, he or she will be calling me for future work? Um, what about it gets you excited? Greg Carrozza, late. Somebody mark that down. <laughs> Trying to finish a track over the next hour. Well, what could possibly be more important, doing a quiz with me, Greg, or finishing the track? <laughs> Robbie already answered it. Uh, get to keep the publishing and the sync fees. Is that how everybody feels? Pat answered it too. I like direct... Uh, 
soup because it's much closer to placement than a library. Well, that's true. A library might get you, you know, might pitch that piece of music of yours 20 times during the course of a year. So there's that. Uh, the fact that I'm sure it's going to be heard. Does direct to supervisor have a faster response than a library? You mean a faster response from taxi or a faster response from the client, Akira? Good morning, FJ Music, or good evening, <laughs> sorry. Well, just because a supervisor okays something doesn't necessarily mean he get the gig because supervisors really kind of curate the meal and put the food on the platter and then stick it in front of the executive producer or the director, depending if it's a TV show or a movie. Ultimately, they probably make the decision. I know a lot of people want to believe that supervisors are kind of like A&R people, that they're the music pickers, they're the music presenters, and the music clearance people as well in many cases faster response from the client. Uh, well, supervisor, the, on, the only response you're probably going to get is if they want to use it, yeah. Um, and that's not necessarily the case, Akira, because there are all kinds of different scenarios. Um, for instance, the, the busker listing that we ran a couple of months ago, um, and we had a big hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Uh, we had to get it into my friend's hands. We got it into his hands on Sunday evening. He had a 9 a.m. deadline. Um, and then I played it cool because I am so cool that once we forwarded it, I didn't say, so what did you think? Did you listen? Do you think we got a shot? Did any of our members, you know, stick out to you? Um, I didn't do any of that. I just sent it over and go, here you go. Um, and then it was probably, so remember, it was hurry up, hurry up. And then uh, it was probably a week or 10 days before uh, my friend, the supervisor said, by the way, uh, there is some really good stuff in that taxi thing. I sent a bunch of them over. And I just wrote back and said, cool. Because <laughs> I'm so cool that I just had to use one word, cool. And then it was probably two or three weeks later that we actually heard that a taxi member had been picked for the slot. So you tell me, uh, they needed it in a hurry, the TV show was shot, it was edited, they couldn't find a busker, and they reached out to the number one problem solver in the entire musical world, Taxi. And we solved the problem for him, but we didn't know it probably took a month or so. I could probably go back and check my emails to give you exact dates, but it was like a month, I think, from the moment we sent it till we heard something for a hurry up. So I don't know. I wish I had a better answer for you. And... Uh, does direct to supervisor have a faster ROI return on investment to a library? Not really. You know, I was reading a business book the other day. I want to say it was a marketing book because um, that's mostly what I read. And it made a point that most marketers are going for the sale right now today. They want you to see whatever it is that they're hawking and get you to pull the trigger and buy it. And certainly, you know, that's a big part of a business is selling stuff, getting paid for the product or service you make. However, the more sustainable businesses are the ones that don't turn their nose up at the, the quick ROI, but realize that once the connection is made, that they've invested in the future. 
and that's what we hear from so, so, so many taxi members is that first forward and that first callback from a library opens the door to a direct relationship for them on an ongoing basis. So with that in mind, one might provide, might provide a quicker return on investment. Um, the other one might provide a better long-term investment. You know, would you, you know what? It's day trading versus slow and steady wins the race. Would you buy, you know, 10 shares of Apple today um, because you read something or saw something on the news tonight that, you know, the new Apple iPhone is coming out uh, Monday, okay? So you buy some Apple figuring there's going to be a little spike in sales when the new one comes out or maybe a big spike in sales and you're going to ride that wave and then you're going to cash out because you have incredible intuition and know when the market or when the price of Apple shares are going to drop back down. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, get in for, so I, I don't know, what is Apple at now? Um, let's find out. I think it's about 125, 134, woo! Yeah, I own some Apple. <laughs> um, went up by 1.87% today. Okay, so uh, 134 bucks a share. So you buy 10 shares at 1100 or whatever that would be, uh, $1,340, right? Um, and it goes up by 2%. So you make yourself $250, or no, is it $25? Yeah, you make $25 um, because it goes up 2%. Or you could buy Apple stock the day the first iPhone came out and really impressed the hell out of you, um, whatever year that was, 2009, I think, and pay practically nothing per share and just hold on to it for 12 years and watch it turn into enough money to buy a house so on one hand, you could make yourself 25 bucks overnight on a gamble. On the other hand, you could make the long-term investment and say, I'm going to buy this stock because I think this company is going to do good for the long term um, and make a fortune. So the same thing could be said for pitching your song to a music supervisor, getting it in a show on Netflix for, I don't know, $2,500 to $3,500 for a sync fee, direct supervisor, no library involved, and boom, you've got cash in hand. On the other hand, that same piece of music in a library, will it make more than that $2,500 or $3,000 over a period of the next 10 years? May or it may not. But if you get enough pieces of music in enough libraries, then chances are, over that period of time, they will. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that many of you already know this, but um, where was I? I? Just saw Chris say reinvest the dividends, and it, and it uh, got me off track. Um, sorry, Chris. <laughs> Don't write anything that's going to get my attention anymore. Um, Michael, I bought Apple at $27 a share. Um, I forget, I did buy it the day I, I bought a, a chunk of it the day that the first iPhone came out. When I touched the first iPhone and swiped, I literally came right back here to this very spot, sat at my desk, called a stockbroker friend of mine and said, I want to buy $25,000 worth of Apple because we just had like a, not a savings bond, but you know, something that was had just rolled over and the cash was just sitting there in account in an account so uh, and the stockbroker said no because he was a friend he said i won't let you buy a single stock that's madness no you should put it in like you know vanguard or something and so i went and got it elsewhere and that twenty five thousand dollars has turned into a lot of money since that day um but you have to pay taxes on it <laughs> there's that um, anyway, so, I, you know what, here's my feeling, just my own personal opinion. Again, I don't make this music, so I'm not sitting exactly where you guys sit, but 
what you want to do, I would think, is, is hedge your bets. You know, do I own some Vanguard? Yeah. Um, do I own Apple? Yeah. Um, so do a little of each. It's like some of our most uh, profitable members, most uh, successful dollar-wise members, have told me many, many times that they put their stuff in non-exclusive catalogs as well as exclusive catalogs. Pierre, Tesla, yep. Gotta say, bought some Tesla a little while back as well. Um, I mean, isn't it obvious? I mean, believe me, I'm no stock picking expert. There have been a couple times where I've lost every penny on something. Um, my then business partner and I got friends and family shares of mp3.com when that went public. And we all lost, uh, both of us lost like every dollar of it. So sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Um, so diversify your submissions. Yeah. Uh, diversify. There you go. That's the word. Capital gains tax. Yes. <laughs> um, and they're about to go up considerably. Corporate taxes are going up, which are going to crush small businesses. Um, capital gains tax is going to go from like 22% to, I want to say, 39%. Uh, just crazy. Ah, oh, you sold your Tesla and Elon Musk started acting like a crazy person? No, that's the time to buy. Everybody thought Steve Jobs was nuts too. I like a good mad genius every now and then. Who's buying Lucid stock? I don't know. I don't even know what Lucid is. For the successful taxi members, Akira wants to know, do they tend to have relationships with many libraries or many supervisors uh, or 50-50 split? I would say that and these are educated guesses, uh, that 80 to 90 percent of the successful members um, work almost exclusively with libraries and that they've got their stuff in many libraries, like at least 10 libraries. So, you know, I, I harp about this all the time. It kills me when people say, my publisher, uh, or I just signed everything to my publisher. Um, I, I sent them, you know, this one track via taxi. They loved it. They asked me if I had anything else and they ended up signing everything else that I had on my hard drive. I personally think that's a bad move, um, bad, bad move, because like I've said many times, some companies have certain clientele they do really, really well with, and if that show ends its run or gets canceled for whatever reason, they could lose 50% of their business overnight. And it might take them another six months or a year or two years or three to get another great show like that that they've got a tight relationship with and therefore a lot of their music gets used in that show or others. So I, if I were you, I would always hedge my bets. Anytime you start a relationship with a new library, I would dip my toe in the water. If they say, let me hear everything you got, don't lie to them, but just say, I, I've only got a few things available and send them three or four or five. I know it would be awesome to be able to tell your family and friends and your fellow taxi members, I just got, you know, 37 tracks signed it as one publisher. That's a dangerous move. It's like putting all your money in one stock. It really is. Um, so there you go. Quiet cars are bad for animals crossing the road. That's true. Um, I've got a plug-in hybrid and it actually, and I think this is a law, maybe only in California because we're kind of nutty that way. Um, but my car actually makes a sound on the exterior of the car so that people who are blind and crossing the street know that there's a car there. If I don't know if squirrels or possums or raccoons can hear that sound or not. Maybe they should have like a, a raccoon mating call coming out of the front grill. Um, some do want a minimum of five. I, I've 
you know, that's okay. You know, if they reach out to you and say, can you, can you do an album for me, you know, 10? Yeah, that's a project, but that's not taking everything you've got in your catalog and putting all those eggs in that one basket. That's doing a project for them. I want to submit to a car sound listing. <laughs> Yeah, it does take time. Robbie says, so it takes time to find the right libraries that'll place your music. Yeah, uh, once you find those relationships, then you start earning dollars. Absolutely. Um, and you could put your money or your, your music with a great library that's got a great reputation. A bunch of members love them. They've been around for 20 years. Clearly, they get stuff in great shows. And you get your stuff in there and it just lays there like a lox because maybe they were so blown away by your Greek music that they thought, I should sign this because I don't have any Greek music and you never know when the day is going to come where I'm going to need some Greek instrumental tracks. And so they offer you a deal on those. But lo and behold, they mostly do um, reality TV shows, not travel stuff not episodic stuff, and so they've got to wait until the Kardashians go to Greece before that music is going to get used. Um, whereas if you work with a library that does a lot of stuff for the Travel Channel, your Greek stuff might get used many to, you know, several to many times in a year. Uh, so there you go. Um, Is there a request for folly material? You mean like Ziegfeld's Follies? That kind of folly? Or Fulton's Follies? Which follies are you referring to there, Crash? Uh, wow, Ryan had a, a deer whistle. Is that what your wife uses when she come here, deer, <laughs> blows a whistle? Oh, man, I've never been funny, and I probably never will be. Uh, electric car ambient, there you go. Oh, look at that, I didn't shave for two days, got fuzzy cheeks today. Um, I had a deer jump over my car one time. I was driving in my little yellow Triumph Spitfire around 1982 or 83 through the Wachong Mountains in beautiful New Jersey on my way to the House of Sound or whatever it's called, a studio where Cool and the Gang recorded. And I was going there to mix something. I can't remember the name of the place. I want to say House of Sound or something like that. Anyway, um, in East Orange, New Jersey. And I was on my way home from the studio at like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, a deer came running down a hillside. But it was totally dark outside. And I was on a two-lane blacktop that was like S-curves all the way through this section of the mountain range. And a deer came running down the hillside and literally vaulted over the hood of my car as I was doing like 50 miles an hour through those curves. Uh, I have a Friday face on Thursday. There you go. Mooses Don't Jump. That's a good name for a book. Fuzzy Cheeks, nice title for a song. Every Husband Needs a Deer Whistle, yep. Deer are scary. Did you ever see uh, the video of the deer in the car with the guy beating the living daylights out of him, like hoofing him to death? And then there was a, was there a video out many years ago, I think it was even before YouTube, a guy in a phone booth that got his ass kicked by a deer? Saw a woman driving a convertible when a deer jumped over her car. The deer hoofs were three inches above her hair, head. She didn't even see the deer. Oh, dear. <laughs> you 
kept driving like nothing happened. Yeah, well, that was I, I, my Triumph Spitfire was a convertible, but I had the top up. But man, oh man, you know, I don't know if that deer knew he was going to clear the car, but I was definitely that car was a lot of fun in mountainous, you know, like S turns on mountainous roads. Um, so I was going pretty fast, and uh, he cleared the car, but just barely. Good morning, a running club name, hoofing to death. Um, oh, yeah, I still have a couple more things to talk to you about. <laughs> Let's see. Um, how many of you get excited about pitching, and I need plus ones in this, pitching for listings where it's a major label artist looking for songs to cut? Plus one if those listings make you want to submit. Um, yeah, it is blue, Nancy. <laughs> And this is kind of like World War I army dress uniform color. Brother-in-law hit a deer on his motorcycle. How did a deer get a motorcycle? Oh, your brother-in-law's motorcycle. <laughs> um, We have a lot of listings for uh, major label artists. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy's my fashion critic, but always complimentary, I might add. <laughs> Problem is, like, I bought this shirt at the Ralph Lauren outlet mall or store like 10 years ago. They eventually do fall apart. The the sport shirts or whatever you call them, the dressier shirts, these things will last literally for decades. But the t-shirts, the dryer beats them up. Wow, <laughs> bird flew into your car and flew out the other side. Um, I, I once had a pheasant fly into the windshield of a car I was driving on a country road. It broke the windshield. It made a mess. Uh, but it tasted really good. Uh, I was wondering if there might be a way that we can know if we already have music with the library when the listing comes out besides calling in, like a color code or even just the city. We can't. We tried doing the city thing years ago where we'd say LA based or New York based. Problem was that there are many libraries in LA and several in New York, and now they're kind of all over the place, so that didn't work. Another problem we had was thanks to Facebook, um, if one member found out which library it was, they would tell 50 other members on a Facebook group, and then all those people would just reach right out to the library on their own. And the library would say, where did you hear about this? Oh, through taxi. No, it was a taxi face, a non-sanctioned taxi Facebook group that we had nothing to do with, one in particular that I'm not even allowed to go in and look at. And, and uh, yeah, I found out about it from taxi. And then I get a call from the library owner. Um, yeah. I don't think people realize, you know, one hand, I, I'm conflicted on this subject because our members are very generous with what they've learned in helping other members. At the same time, they're like overly generous. Sometimes I feel like some members like, oh yeah, I know, you know, Tom over at this library because it makes them feel a little important maybe. Like they're connected and they're cool, they're on the inside track, you know? And, and then they end up like turning other people on to that relationship, which if, the person they turn on to that relationship um, has kind of a less than professional side, let's say, that can reflect badly on you and waste the library owner's time. On the other hand, if they're really good, then they end up being your competition. And even if they're really good but they're not in your genre, because uh, I've had people say that to me, well, I do orchestral and they do, you know, like rootsy country Americana stuff. That's true, but the Facebook group that they're on with those other 117 people, how many of those people also do orchestral? And it becomes like um, a geometric 
spreading of a virus. Boy, how's that for uh, appropriate these days? Um, so while you turn somebody on to a relationship that you think isn't going to cause any competition to you, um, they will turn other people on to that as it becomes more geometric, and there you go. So now you've got 21 competitors instead of just one or none. On the flip side of that, it could be that maybe it is equitable because maybe you are on the receiving side of those turn-on connections when things go geometric. So maybe you put it out there and give a little, and then eventually you get a little. I don't know. Exponential growth. There's a big word for the day. Exponential. Did you miss something? Hmm. Maybe. <laughs> um, Okay, now let's talk about our final subject for the last nine minutes, which is how many of you think strategically when you're pitching? Um, uh, oh, I talked about this a little bit before, but let's think about um, like the Greek listing. A, a Greek listing is coming up in a few days. And it was a listing that we ran once before. We got very few submissions. Um, sometimes we, we forward nothing because maybe we get 16 things in and there's just nothing good enough. It's not like we're under contract that we've got to forward something. So um, we're rerunning the listing at the company's request. It happens, I don't know, several times a month, a few times a month. So I would think, again, going back to the bazooki, um, the world's coolest name for an instrument, bazooki. Uh, I would go buy myself, you know, a seventy-dollar bazooki on Amazon, or borrow one from a music store or a friend or something, and I would make some Greek tracks because my logic is um, there aren't going to be a lot of other Greek tracks in that library. Therefore. Whenever they've got a customer doing, you know, like that Samantha Brown travel show and she goes to Santorini, um, it could end up being that 10 of your Greek pieces could get used in an hour of Samantha Brown. Um, and maybe, you know, usually Samantha Brown doesn't just do one episode about Greece. She would do four, five, six or more because she goes to Santorini and several other places in Greece. So maybe that's a, a strategic way to decide where you're pitching is, um, what's the phrase? There's a business phrase, um, be everywhere your competitors aren't, right? So go for, go for the edges, go for the niches. Um, don't go for the stuff with the mass appeal. And while you might be less frequently, your music might be used less frequently because you're in a niche or somewhere out on the edge. Um, when it does get used, you have a much, when there's a request for that type of music, let's call it Greek, um, you stand a much higher probability of being the person whose music is going to get used. The Hora Bazooki on eBay is a great deal, but you probably have to change out the tuners and get a proper setup, they sound great. Any idea how much they cost, Peter? Greek music is often in a 7-4 meter. Interesting. I know, wouldn't a good Euro be really good right now? A bazooki, a weapon? <laughs> That'd be a great name for like a dog. If you had um, a dog that looked like Spuds McKenzie, whatever kind of terrier those are, I would love to have a dog that looked like Spuds McKenzie named Bazooki. Two hundred bucks for a bazooka. Bazooki. <laughs> yeah. Um I I would imagine that you could buy a really cheap one. Let's find out. I am going right now. Where am I going? To Amazon. Bazooki.
Bazooki instrument. Works better when it's two words. Here we go. Um, here's a Van Gogh A style mandolin musical sunburst. Oh, the, I don't know. Is that a bazooki? Here's a Roosbeck bazooki with deluxe gig bag, 591. Here's a Baglama Greek traditional musical instrument, handmade small bazooki in black for 200. Yeah, the old bazooki's not that cheap. Wow. Maybe it's time to open a bazooki store. <laughs> and, and put wild paintings on them. Then you could call them like kooky bazookies, right? <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I'm high on Trader Joe's caffeinated whatever they are. I know that <clears throat> I would be curious to see um, if there are any bazooki samples out there that anybody could get good enough because they're, the listing that's coming up uh, asks for really simple Greek music. So whatever the you know acoustic bass is that might be used on Greek music combined with, I don't know, a little concertina, a little accordion thing and a bazooki, you might have what you need or a little finger bells or something I don't know anyway um, could somebody get good enough with samples that you couldn't tell the difference possibly well here let me go back to the virtual home before I say goodbye there we go there's that halo right now I don't know what this, oh man, I've got to take that software off my laptop. I think I've got competing software going on. Anyway, um, here comes your Zoom meeting. Miriam, what could possibly be more important than me? Um, any other thoughts? We got two minutes. Any other thoughts on pitching? Um, what influences, yeah, go, go freestyle on me. Tell me what influences you to pitch to a listing. Oh, you know what? I forgot to include the taxi in the picture. Thanks for noticing that, uh, Mike. Oh, the taxi's actually back there behind my green screen right now. <laughs> A sparse cue, yep. A reference that you like. Hey, Cass. Um, how far in the future it is? I'm slow. That's interesting. I go with the genres I'm confident at producing. Um, my hierarchy from Ian is song for an artist, song for film and TV with payout um, to music soup. Um, a licensing company with singer-songwriter, country, and pop songs, no instrumentals. Interesting. It's in my wheelhouse. Um, I have a chance to get past the screener. Number one reason to pitch is I have time to do it. Um, Pierre, my skill set my niche. Um, Mike says, the unknown influences me. It's scary. <laughs> Heidi, artist listings, um, goes to young Michael. I usually just listen to the references in the instrumental section and pick the ones I'm most comfortable with. That sounds like a good way to go. Available hours is critical. Um, it'd be singer-songwriter for me, says Nancy, but I'm busy getting my taxi business education. Um, reference tracks seem like they're doable. Greg Crows is currently focused on making new relationships and advertising. 
um, the ability to create music that's wanted, if the music is interesting to me, instrumentals only, um, if it would sound authentic coming from me, um, Rally seems to be coming along. Um, really no news to talk about other than I was engaged in an email exchange with the head of sales at the hotel. Um, and she said, hey, can we talk about uh, the 2022 contract? Because right now I'm, I've signed the contract for 2021. And I said to her, any feeling from you guys as to how our state government or federal government you know, is gonna affect this year's rally? What Would you give me odds on if we can do it or we can't? And she didn't respond to that. She almost seemed to be avoiding the question because she answered everything else. I asked her like four questions in one email and that was the one she didn't answer. Um, but she did ask me to sign a contract for 2022. I thought that was cute. Anyway, we should go because it's two minutes over. Um, Anyway, uh, thank you guys. Uh, great input. Hope you enjoyed the show. And remember, I am out of the office next week. Um, I may be able to, I'm definitely not doing a regular taxi TV on Monday. I am not doing a quarantini on Tuesday. I may miss you guys so much that maybe I'll do one on Thursday of next week. I don't know. Um, gonna play it by ear. So at the very least, I will be back the following week, um, back in the office and doing some uh, taxi TVs. A substitute teacher, class goes wild. No kidding. Maybe I'll get uh, a deer whistle and get my dear wife to cover it. <laughs> Woo. Anyway, thanks for hanging out, guys. This was fun, hopefully uh, productive. I, got a lot. I want to go back and read all these comments and think about this, see if there's any way we can make Taxi even a better company for you. With that, I bid you a fond farewell. Adios. Yeah.